Thank you, Reiner, also for hosting, and welcome to everyone to Northside Community Church today. There aren't any real particular announcements. Uh, I'll mention that we had our AGM last Sunday night. I think it well, went well. I didn't get any hateful emails, so that's, that's a good thing. <clears throat> um, I don't think anybody else did either. But just, you know, we're doing this series right now on, on the, our vision, pursuing Jesus in community. And uh, Tim uh, reminded us last week about being in community with God. And it, Matthias today is going to talk about being in community with one another and what that means. And then next week, I'm going to wrap up the series with community for the world. And so I'm looking forward to that. And then uh, we'll have Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Sunday. And then we're going to begin a series in the Sermon on the Mount, because the Sermon on the Mount is really about how we live this out. How do we live out that vision of pursuing Jesus in community? And, and Jesus tells us, this is what it looks like when heaven breaks in, right? We, we pray, uh, you know, your will be done on heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. And we're going to examine Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount. And that's not a pie in the sky kind of thing that we... Uh, He's going, if you're a follower of me, this is the way you live your life. So we're going to be examining that for the next uh, couple of months as well. Anyway, before um, Matthias speaks, I'm going to pray for him and pray for God's uh, presence and blessing and uh, guidance to each one of us and to him. So let me pray. Father God, we come to you and we're all coming from various circumstances, some very diverse, but we come together in you. And we are here pursuing Jesus. I pray for Matthias this morning, that as he shares what you have laid on his heart, that you will pour your spirit upon him in a very special and powerful way uh, as he opens your word for us. Pray that each one of us, we know your spirit is in, in each one of our homes and that you are at work in our lives. Pray that we would be people who would be cooperating with that that we would be people who would submit to you and allow your, your truth to transform us. And so we just look forward to these next moments and what Matthias has. Uh, thank you for Reiner and Mackie and Joan and their part in this service. Pray you're blessed upon each of them. And Lord, for each person in their own circumstance this morning, you know, a number of, number of devices that are logged in here and each device and each individual represents a different set of circumstances that they are dealing with. I pray for each of us that we would be looking to you. You are the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. So we pray that you would uh, be, we know that you are perfecting each one of us. That is not always an easy thing for us to do. It involves challenge and, and, and difficulty, whether it's relational or financial or whatever it is. But I pray that these things would drive us to you, not drive us away from you. Thank you again for where we live, for the many benefits that we enjoy. We give you thanks and praise. We pray for these places in the world. I think of Yemen just now and just uh, uh, the hunger and things that are going on there for other places in the world, Lord, where there is great strife. And uh, again, we live in a very peaceful land with wonderful first responders and and, and government, stable government. We pray for our, those in authority over us uh, that you will give them wisdom. I pray for the other churches in our community, Lord, as they gather this morning in one form or another, that again, that your gospel will continue to be proclaimed, uh, that as your truth goes forth, that it would, uh, we know, well, you've said that your word will go out and it will accomplish what you want it to accomplish. And so we want to agree with that and see that happen. We want to see your will be done in North Delta as it is in heaven and around the world. So, yeah, we just commit this time to you, commit Matthias to you, and uh, thank you for what you are about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Ready, <clears throat> ready to go. All right. Morning, everyone. So, uh, lots going on this morning. 
uh, daylight savings time in effect. Uh, I don't know if you guys are feeling it, but spring is coming. Uh, the sun is uh, coming out. It's getting warmer. Uh, I got to actually go for a walk around like six o'clock and it wasn't pitch dark. So that was really nice. Um, and um, yeah, uh, this, this, this time, uh, I don't know if you, if you guys remember last time, um, I had this image of, a, of an ooey gooey cheesy sandwich. Um, no, no food metaphors today, um, but uh, it is International Pie Day today. So March 14th, uh, 3.14, if you're following the math reference there. So uh, I encourage you to uh, enjoy a slice of pie as you ponder what we talked about this morning. Um, the other thing is you might notice uh, I'm sitting in my living room today. So last time I, I came to you from the kitchen and uh, there was uh, a light behind my head. Maybe there was a little too much light. At the AGM, I tried another position and I was kind of in shadow, so not enough light. And so now we're here uh, at, on my living room couch. So I know a lot of you are on your couch as well. So my living room to your living room, um, what better way to talk about community with one another uh, this morning? So yeah, if I end up preaching a couple more times during this pandemic, uh, you might have had the grand tour of the place because there's really only a couple bedrooms and a, and a bathroom that you haven't seen. So there you go. Um, just by by uh, way of warning to, to let you guys know. Um, <laughs> thanks, Sam and Judy. Um, things are probably going to go a little bit longer today. Um, there's there's a lot to cover and um, nobody's ever given me a specific time limit. But whatever that is, I'm probably going to go a bit over that. Um, because there's a few important things we want to talk about. There's uh, the vision that I'm going to recap. I'm going to try and just lay out the entire vision for us so we can kind of hear it all together one more time. And then we're going to talk about community with one another. And then at the end, there's also just um, a very important current issue that I think we need to address that specifically relates to community with one another. So we're going to talk about that. And it's going to take a little more time at the end, but let's, let's dive in. So we're on week six uh, of our seven week series talking about our, our vision of Northside Community Church. And because we're nearing the end of the series, I wanted to just kind of start doing some recaps to, to hopefully, um, hopefully the greater vision of the church has started to kind of take shape in your minds. But I really wanted to just kind of lay it all out again, um, because I know most of you are only receiving it in bits and pieces on a Sunday morning. And I recognize aside from community group discussions, this may be the only chance you have to really um, have conversations around it. And that's really not enough time to, to really grasp this vision or, or have it to start to, to really influence the things that we think, say, and do. And to be clear, that's, that's not necessarily the goal of this series, that, that by the end of the series, you will have fully absorbed the vision. Like, that would be great. Um, but as staff and elders, like, we've been pulling this vision together, rolling it around in our minds, having conversations about it for the better part of a year now. And we're still learning to adopt the vocabulary in, of our vision into our language and to start to filter our thoughts and our actions through our understanding of this vision's implications. It, it takes a lot of time and it takes practice as well. But our hope is, um, though, that by, by the end of this series, you will have the framework of the vision down and you will have a, a working knowledge of how these various elements sort of fit together. That's, that's our goal. And we had, we had an introduction to this series but if you think about it, really, this entire series is kind of an introduction. So that as we continue to revisit these themes over the coming months and years as community of, of Northside, uh, and as you start to walk through your own personal faith journey, that you'll, you'll be able to ground your, your knowledge and your experiences to something. That the vision will be that thing that you can ground your knowledge and experiences to. That, that the vision will essentially provide you with these buckets uh, Tim Donikowski likes to use this language, these, that buckets for you to, to pour all of your knowledge, all of the sermons that you're watching or the podcast that you're listening to or the scripture that you're reading or the books that you're reading, and also all of your experiences, your, your time spent listening to God or in prayer or in service or, or even just in conversation with others, that all of that knowledge and experience of your faith journey could be poured into these buckets so that they, they're not just floating around so that we can actually hold on to the things that we're learning and turn them over in our minds and start to think critically about them and talk about them with a shared language that we can all understand so that we might be changed. Just as it says in Ephesians 4, 12 to 13, so that the body of Christ, that's all of us, may be built up 
until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's our end goal, the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. How does this vision help us to do that? Because we believe that this vision is a picture of what life as a follower of Jesus looks like. If you're taking notes, feel free to write that down. There's gonna be a few opportunities to write some things down. So again, what is the purpose of this vision? It's to give us a picture of what life as a follower of Jesus looks like. That means it's not only relevant to us here at Northside Community Church, it's for all followers of Jesus. We didn't simply uh, create it just for us. We didn't simply make this up. It's pulled directly from scripture, we think. And, uh, but we did make some decisions about the language of this vision and how we want to talk about being followers of Jesus that is specific to Northside. Again, why? Because the Bible is full of metaphors. And anytime you're talking about something spiritual, you have to do it using metaphors. And if we're not clear on those metaphors and what they mean, they will easily lose their spiritual significance. So you may have already, already noticed, for, for example, that I've been using the term followers of Jesus. Okay, so this is an intentional choice already. Some people would say Christians. Some people say disciples. Some people like to say apprentices. Well, which is it? The thing is that they're all true. Each of these words teaches us something about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But jumping back and forth between these terms can be confusing. So as staff and elders, we've settled on the language of followers of Jesus. Because if Jesus is a person who is living and active, he is on the move, then pursuing Jesus, which we're, which we're, we're saying pursuing Jesus in community, and if we're, if we're pursuing Jesus, we automatically makes us followers of Jesus. It's not just what we do, it's who we are. We're to be defined by that. We are followers of Jesus. And we see this language directly in scripture. Matthew 4, 19 says, Jesus says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So as we pursue Jesus, as we're followers of him and we follow him, we believe that he leads us into community with God, community with one another and community for the world. Let me try to break this down for you. So, so where do we see Jesus leading us into these three communities? Well, Tim last week gave us this beautiful picture of a life spent moment by moment in community with God here and now in our present lives. But this is not only true today, it is actually the fundamental truth of the overarching story of life on earth. Before the world began, we see the community of God, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existing in perfect love together, creating humankind to be in that community with them. We were invited into the community of God but we rejected that invitation. Both then and now our sin separates us from participating with that community of God. So God sends his son Jesus from that community of God to us to pay for our sin and provide us with a way back into community with God. And then Jesus returns to the father. So pursuing Jesus leads us into community with God to be in that community. The purpose for which we were originally created Jesus not only invites us into that community, but he is the provision for it. He, he provides the way for us to get back into that community. He is the vine. We are the branches. It is only through him that we are brought back into community with God. And notice I say brought back. This is an important part of our vision because that's where we started. That's the truth at the center of the universe that we were originally created by God to be in community with God. And as we accept that truth, and we're brought back into the community of God, it's there that we recapture our identity, purpose, and provision for life. You might have heard Tim use these words. So again, if you're taking notes, you'll want to write this down. I'll say it again. Within the community of God, we recapture our identity, purpose, and provision for life. It's not something we find or we discover within ourselves or invent. It's about recapturing the truth of who we are, what our purpose is, and how we're able to live out that purpose in a way that has existed since before the beginning of time. 
And when we come into contact with that truth about our identity, purpose, and provision for life, we're completely transformed from the inside out. And so that's why we say, and you can write this down too as well if you like, within the community of God, this looks like transformative truth. That's a key phrase for us. Again, within the community of God, this looks like transformative truth. We conform to it, not the other way around. And if we are not in the community of God, being transformed by the truth about our identity, purpose, and provision for life, we're going to have a distorted view of how we should act in community with one another and community for the world. So that's community with God. But as we pursue Jesus in community with God, he also leads us into community with one another. This is clear from scripture as well. Jesus says, John 13, 34, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. Why is that? Because as we follow Jesus into community with God, other followers of Jesus are caught up within that community as well. All who choose to follow Jesus end up within the community of God. So if we are in community with God, we are also by default in community with one another. And if that community of God is characterized by love, then as followers of Jesus caught up within the community of God, our community with one another must be, to use John's language, characterized by the same love that we see in the community of God. And we're going to be talking more about that today. But you can already see that if we're trying to do community with one another without community with God, our, community, our experience of community with one another is going to be distorted, messy, broken, and painful. And if you've been part of a church for long enough, I'm sure you've experienced that before. But because our love for one another is rooted in being part of the community of God, it is clear that our love for one another will look different than our love for those who are not within the community of God. So even though we're called to love all people, and there's a significant overlap here, this looks a bit differently within the community of one another than it does in community for the world. What does community with one another look like? Well, you can ready your pens again for this, because this is critical. Within the community of one another, this looks like reciprocal love. That's another key phrase for us. I'll say that again. Within the community of one another, this looks like reciprocal love. It's a love that mimics the love that we see within the community of God between the Father and the Son. That may not always be our experience of community with one another. Often this is because we try to exist within the community of one another without living our unique identity and purpose that we recaptured in the community of God. That's our purpose in community with one another, to, to live out our identity and purpose that we recaptured in community with God, to discover our unique gifting and fit within the body of Christ and love God and love others with that unique identity and purpose as best as we possibly can. It's an ongoing process. And it's Jesus's body broken for us that not only gives us the example of what this looks like, but is also the means by which we are able to live that way. But that's how our love for one another differs from the love we show to others. It's meant to be reciprocal, both giving and receiving love. And that's what we're going to unpack today. But this is an expectation we cannot have when we choose to love those who are in the world. And yet Jesus tells us to love those who are in the world. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. That extends beyond those who will love us in return and includes our enemies and even those who hate us. In fact, 1 John 3, 13 says, brothers and sisters, do not be surprised when the world, people of this world will hate you. Jesus himself says in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And this makes sense. How can we expect the world to love us if they're finding their identity, purpose, or provision for life in anything other than the transformative truth that they were created by God to be in relation, relationship with God and that Jesus himself is our provision for life. And so our key purpose within community for the world, and if you've been writing things down, you might wanna write this down as well. Our key purpose within the community of the world is 
to invite people to recapture their identity, purpose, and provision for life. You'll notice the symmetry between our purpose within this community and in community with God. Essentially, our primary responsibility within the world is to invite others to join us in community with God. We believe that is actually the most loving thing that we can do for them. What does this look like? And this is the last key point that you'll want to remember from this vision series, so you can write this down as well. This looks like generous invitation. Generous invitation. What do I mean by that? John 13, 35, right after Jesus says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. He says in verse 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. As we ourselves are caught up in community with God, and by default, community with other, with other followers of Jesus, and we're insistent upon loving God and loving one another as he has loved us, that love overflows, and it spills out of community with God and community with other, and it starts to flow out into every corner of the world. This is how they will know, and the whole world gets to benefit from this immense love that we have for God and for one another. A love that meets physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs of the world, both in the short term and in eternity, as they are also drawn up into community with God. So community with God, with one another, and for the world. That love that we have for one another is our generous invitation for the world to taste and see that the Lord is good and that all who are weary and burdened, that all who thirst might come to Jesus, drink of him who is the living water and never be thirsty again. And Mark's going to talk more about that next week. So there you have it. That's the whole thing. Jesus calls us to follow him as we pursue him. He leads us into community with God, with one another and for the world. And hopefully that gives you a better sense of why we're doing this and how our engagement with each of these communities is essential as followers of Jesus. Today, we're gonna to further unpack community with one another. And now that you have that entire vision framework in your minds, let's, let's dive in. I've already said that community with one another is where we live out our unique identity and purpose. This is our attempt as staff and elders to give us some simple language that we can use to talk about community with one another and also be a memorable summary so it's easy to recall. What is community with one another? Oh yeah, it's living out my identity and purpose within the body of Christ. But there's actually so much wrapped up within that summary, even in those two little words, living out. How do we live out our purpose and identity with one another? I mean, we, we worship together, we teach, we equip, we build each other up, we spur each other on, we sharpen one another. There are so many activities that embody, and I use that word intentionally, community with one another. But there's no way I could touch on each of those in any meaningful way in a single sermon. Our, our plan is that over time, we will revisit these communities and have a teaching series dedicated to each of them as these, but also that as these, these, these themes come up, whether it's worship or discipleship or accountability or baptism, that we'll be taking those themes and constantly pointing back to how they fit within our vision which is a picture of life as a follower of Jesus described in the language of Northside. So I'm not going to talk today about all those different activities that we take part in with one another, but know that those things are accounted for in the two words living out because we live out our identity and purpose into each of those activities. Instead today, I want us to really think deeply about this quality or, or heart posture that we believe is absolutely critical to community with one another. What we are calling reciprocal love. The picture we see in the Bible of community with one another is reciprocal love. Now, why did we pick these two words to summarize community with one another? Well, first off, love is easy, right? If you've been to church, if you've read the Bible, you've heard this before, as followers of Jesus, we're called to love one another. In fact, of the 47 commands in the Bible that are specifically directed to the church, using the words one another, so referring to the church, 15 of them, or about one third, specifically mention love. To tolerate one another in love, 
to be devoted to one another in love, to serve one another through love. And 11 times scripture tells us to simply love one another. I don't know if there's anything in the whole Bible that's clearer than this when it comes to God's expectations of us. It's so simple and it's so difficult, but it's so clear. But what about the world? The word reciprocal? <clears throat> Where do we see this? Well, first of all, remember that this is specifically addressed to the church, those followers of Jesus that find themselves caught up within the community of God. Doesn't the Bible teach us to, to love everyone? Yes, but like I said, that the love we have for one another is different than our love for others. Why? Because it is characterized by the love we receive from God and are witness to between the Father and the Son within the community of God. How do we know this? Take the words one another. In English, this is two words. But in Greek, the language of these commands were originally, the, the, the language these commands were originally written in, in the Greek, one another is actually only one word. The word is alelon. Feel free to try that one on for size if you like. Alelon. And it specifically means each other acting mutually or reciprocally upon the other. It is meant for an identifiable group of people acting reciprocally upon each other. So we see that word reciprocal there already in the one another commands. The one another commands have reciprocity built into them. It's, it's assumed. But let's probe a little bit deeper. Another approximately one third of the one another commands in scripture are dedicated to unity. So one third talk about love, one third talk about unity. For example, Mark 9, 50, be at peace with one another. John 6, 43, do not grumble among one another. Colossians 3, 13, bear with one another and forgive one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Romans 12, 16 and 15, 5 and so on. So 15 verses calling the community of one another to unity. So love and unity. But how do we achieve unity? Like love, I get that, right? Like I, I can think I know how to love someone. I think we're pretty good at talking about love in the church, how love is an action and not just a feeling and how we go about loving people. I think we've, we've done a pretty good job of that. But, but how do we create unity? How do we go about unifying with people? Well, this is cool. I think, I think this is cool. Check this out. So one third of the commands specifically addressed to how we live in community with one another about love. One third are about unity. And the rest of them can really be broken down into two major categories, humility and encouragement. Humility and encouragement. First of all, humility. These, these are one another commands such as give preference to one another in honor. Romans 12, 10. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Philippians 2, 3. Serve one another. Galatians 5. Wash one another's feet. John 13. Clothe yourselves in humility toward one another, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. So you can see examples of this. Humility is clearly meant to be a defining characteristic of our actions with one another. But what about encouragement? So listen to these. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6.2. Speak truth to one another. Don't lie to one another. Comfort one another concerning the resurrection. Encourage and build one another up, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Stir one another up toward love and good deeds, Hebrews 10.24. Encouragement is also clearly meant to be a defining characteristic of our actions with, with one another. Why such an emphasis on humility and encouragement? Here's my theory. Here's my thesis statement. Because humility and encouragement are the building blocks of unity. Humility and encouragement are the building blocks of unity. And they are the perfect picture of the reciprocal love that we witness between the Father and the Son within the community of God. Let's see if I can illustrate this for you. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me or swipe or tap or whatever you need to do in your Bible app to Philippians 2. And I know we recently went through the book of Philippians as a church, but I think that actually only helps us here. Hopefully that means 
I don't need to do too much explaining of the passage, and we can just start to see this passage through the lens of our vision. So that it moves us from something we simply just know and understand to something we can actually take hold of and allow the truth of to transform the way we think, say, and do. So let's start in chapter two, verse one, for a little bit of context. Paul starts with a rhetorical argument. He's trying to impress the following ideas upon the Philippian followers of Jesus that he's addressing. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, it's not really an if. Paul's saying, as followers of Jesus, I know you have experienced these things, even if it's in the smallest of measure. It's a huge understatement that he's making in order to make his point. And he continues. So because you have experienced these things, at least, or at least one of these things, this is verse two now. He says, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. What's Paul talking about here? He's talking about unity, the same mind, the same love in full accord. And then again, he repeats of one mind. Do you think Paul thinks that unity within the community of one another is important? He managed to say it four times in one verse. I think he finds it important. So for who though? For everyone in the one another community. He doesn't say only for leaders and teachers. He doesn't say only if you feel like you're part of the inner circle. He doesn't say only those who have benefited the most from community with one another. He says, if you in any way consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus and have received any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection or sympathy, if you have experienced any of those things in the slightest of ways because of your faith in Jesus, then be committed to unity with those who are also part of that community. So here we have unity. Where do we see humility and encouragement? Well, let's keep reading. This is from verse three now. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Right there. In the very next verse, we see humility. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. What about encouragement? Keep reading. Verse four, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Look to the interests of others. Be concerned with the interests of others. Don't only look to accomplish your own goals and interests. Work for the good of others that they might accomplish their goals and interests. Spur them on to love and good deeds. That's encouragement. Unity in verse two, humility in verse three, encouragement in verse four. And I think wherever you see unity, you're, you will see humility and encouragement close behind because humility and encouragement are the building blocks of unity. They're also the perfect picture of the reciprocal love that we witness between the father and the son within community of God. If we keep reading from where we left off in verse five, Paul says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves. And th this is really the goal of today, that this would be the attitude, the mind that we have in our interactions with one another, that, it, that the mind we would have would be reciprocal love. That the same mind Paul hopes we all share in verse two is one of unity built on humility and encouragement. Have a mind of reciprocal love, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is the mind that Jesus had and we now have as followers of him. Where do we see Jesus having this mind of reciprocal love? Verse six, consider Jesus who, in verse six it says, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and even death on a cross. Jesus, who was in the form of God, 
who is one with the Father in perfect unity, did not, equi- not, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He didn't just hold on to that unity. He didn't desperately cling to it. He didn't shield and protect it from others. In fact, he opened himself up. He made himself vulnerable, making himself subservient to something by taking the form of a servant. And he humbled himself. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and even death on a cross. The core of our faith, the most essential element of our belief, Jesus' death on the cross for our sins, is about a God who humbled himself. And I want to talk a little bit more about this humbling, because I think sometimes we can fly right past this, or think, well, well, Jesus was God, so it was easier for him to humble himself than it is for us. Jesus' death, though, is sometimes referred to by scholars as the humiliation of Christ. Have you ever noticed the similarity between the words humility and humiliate? One has very positive connotations, but the other incredibly negative, even though they come from the same root word. Both English words, humility and humiliate, come from the Latin word humulus, which means lowly. So what's the difference? Well, well, humility is to think of yourself as lowly, while humiliate is to make someone else feel lowly. It's to cut them down. So the difference is who's being acted upon. We don't really use the term this way anymore, but when scripture says that Jesus humbled himself, it really means that Jesus humiliated himself. He made himself lowly. And maybe this is why we've been become so confused about the word humble and, and we consistently misuse it. We see this all the time on TV, right? When people are receiving awards and they're, they're being recognized for the good things they've done and they'll say, I'm just so humbled to be recognized amongst all these other great people who have done amazing things. No, you're not. (laughs) That's the opposite of being humbled. You're not being brought low. You're being lifted up, put on a pedestal in front of everyone to be recognized by how much better you are than the rest of us at whatever it is you're being honored for. Can you tell this is a pet peeve of mine? (laughs) Jesus, on the other hand, lives up to the word in its truest form. He was willing to humiliate himself for us, to remove himself from his lofty position in the presence of God and subject himself to a form of human death that was reserved for the lowest of the low. C.S. Lewis gives us a great picture of this in, in his book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. If you've read it or if you've seen it, the lion who dies in the place of another, a humiliating death. We see he's mocked and beaten and his beautiful mane is shaved away. Jesus allowed himself to be bound, to be blindfolded, and to be beaten by wicked men who hurled insults at him. Think of the humiliation that Jesus went through. The holy and just judge of the entire universe subjected himself to an illegal examination in a mock courtroom in the middle of the night where he was unjustly condemned. A humiliating perversion of justice for the one who is justice himself. Jesus, the faithful one, permitted Judas, one who he loved and cared for and walked with one of his 12 closest companions, to betray him, and he did nothing about it. Jesus, the king of kings, conceded to King Herod and his guard as they treated him with contempt, dressing him in robes for their own entertainment. Jesus, the great high priest and the fulfillment of the law, allowed the chief priests and teachers of the law to think they had gotten the upper hand when he sat silent in front of Pontius Pilate and was condemned to crucifixion. And Jesus, Lord of Lords, led the enemy to believe that victory had been won as blood flowed from his pierced ribs and his limp body was prepared for burial and placed in a tomb. Each of these instances, Jesus had the power to prevent. He could have stopped it at any time. So while these people thought they were humiliating Jesus, cutting Jesus down and making him low, he was the one who was allowing to happen, willingly humbling himself out of his love for us and to bring glory to the Father. And Paul says, have this mind among yourselves. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. In humility, count others more significant than yourselves. 
What does this look like in community with one another? Here's two ways. I think it means giving one another the benefit of the doubt. And I think it means humbly allowing others to think that they've gained the upper hand. I'm not going to unpack those further here. I'll leave that for the follow-up discussion questions that we'll send out later. And just as a plug for those, um, I'll plug this book as well. This is called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness by Tim Keller. The book is, it's less than 50 pages. It's a very small book and the, the words are pretty big. You can get through it depending on how fast you read in one sitting, probably 20, 30 minutes. Um, but a really interesting book talking about humility and self-esteem. I reference it in the discussion questions, um, but I don't know if it's on Amazon. I picked it up from christianbook.com for $1.99. So well, well worth it. But I'll leave that to, uh, to the discussion later on. Okay, so we see the humility of Jesus, but where is the encouragement? Check this out. I think this is really cool. So Jesus dies on the cross. He has made himself low, really as low as he could go. And who swoops in and meets him there? A loving father with arms wide open to receive him and lift him up. We heard this in Joan's story that she shared this morning as well. Listen to this. This is picking up where we left off in verse 8. This is verse 9 now, Philippians 2. Just Jesus has died on the cross. And then in verse nine it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself. He made himself lowly, came as a servant, was humiliated, obedient to the point of death and from that low position, God the Father meets him there and lifts him up. It says the Father has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, from the lowest place which Jesus willingly accepted to the place of the highest honor, above all others, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. The reciprocal love of the Father and the Son. Jesus, in love and unity, hum humbles himself, makes himself low for the glory of God and the father in turn raises him up to a position of honor. If that's not encouragement, then what is for what is encouragement other than to lift someone up from their lowly position? First Thessalonians 5 11 again, encourage one another and build each other up. Have this mind among yourselves that is yours in Christ Jesus, love and unity built upon humility, and encouragement. I humble myself and make myself low. You encourage and build me back up. You humble yourself and make yourself low. I encourage you and lift you back up. Reciprocal love. Each of us acting reciprocally upon each other. We see it in the community of God between father and son. And as we pursue Jesus, he leads us into reciprocal love in community with one another. Hopefully you'll have some time to think through the implications of, of reciprocal love this week and what that looks like in your own life. There will be questions posted later for you to discuss with a community group on your own or with others if you're not part of a community group. But as, as I finish up here, I, just, I wanted to um, finish with one very current and relevant example where we have an opportunity to put reciprocal love into action, to practice love and unity built upon humility and encouragement. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there has been a petition circulating amongst churches in British Columbia. There are a growing number of churches that are feeling worn out by the current COVID restrictions and are becoming more vocal about their opposition to the current health guidelines that prevent religious gatherings. It's my understanding that they feel as though churches are being unjustly targeted, that churches could, could meet safely within current guidelines and that preventing churches from doing so is a violation of their rights of to religious freedom. They also struggle to uh, for they also see the struggle for those within their own communities of one another. And I think their heart breaks for them. And I think they see BC's plan for for reopening as overlooking faith communities 
that are vitally important to the health and well being of their members, while other forms of support are being allowed to remain open. So after petitioning to the government, these churches through letters, drawing attention to the needs of faith communities, and also appealing through our legal system, which could take several months, these churches feel compelled to open their doors for in person worship against government orders. And I don't know how many churches have gone through with this, but the plan was for those churches who agreed to open their doors and welcome back their congregations to in-person worship. It was, the plan was for this to happen today on March 14th. Up until this point, uh, we as leaders at Northside have not been particularly outspoken about this issue of reopening our doors. Uh, for some of you, you may feel though the issue is clear and there's not much else that needs to be said. Um, but as leaders, we're also aware that some of you may feel like more needs to be said. Um, in light of these churches petitioning to reopen and also rallying other churches to do the same, we feel it's necessary to address this issue at this point. So, so that you are aware, um, we as leaders have had several discussions about reopening over the course of the past year, as restrictions have both increased and loosened. Um, we haven't just sat passively and accepted government orders without critically thinking about them. And, and I think, think Ryan in particular for reminding us to, to keep bringing this conversation to the forefront of our discussions. But because we were aware of the intention of several churches to open this Sunday, we planned a special meeting specifically to talk about churches reopening, the implications of that, and what our response at Northside should be. To be clear, for the time being, we have not chosen to begin working toward reopening in-person worship services at Northside against government orders. But this is not a black and white issue. It's not an issue that only has two sides. It's multifaceted and complex. There are many truths and principles from scripture at play here and not all of them align. Here are just a few of these truths that we considered in our discussions. We were created to be in relationship with one another and the current restriction on gatherings is hindering us from being in deep relationship with one another. That's true. But we also read in Romans 13 that we are to obey the authorities that we are subject to and failure to do so will bring judgment upon ourselves. Another truth, the government is using the current health crisis to suspend or supersede certain rights afforded to us in our charter of rights and freedoms and as followers of Jesus, we are called to uphold justice while also caring for the weak and the vulnerable. And at the same time, scripture also teaches that as followers of Jesus, we're called to lay down our rights, following the example of Jesus Christ, who, as we read in Philippians 2 today, relinquished his rights, equality with God, and humbled himself, becoming obedient even to the point of death. And again, Scripture teaches us to care for and comfort one another and bear one another's burdens. It can feel almost impossible to live that way at times within these current restrictions. And our hearts break for those followers of Jesus who are experiencing increased suffering as a result. But we also heed Jesus' warnings in Scripture that as followers of Jesus, we are to expect suffering. And as we read today, we, we need to remind ourselves not to be surprised when the people of this world hate us, or treat us unfairly because they hated Jesus first. Which of these truths do we emphasize? Which do we choose to guide the way that we think, speak, and act about reopening? It's hard to know. And we as leaders want to be honest and open with you to say that we don't all agree on which of these truths we should emphasize. And that's okay. We are choosing reciprocal love. Pursuing Jesus in love and unity built upon humility and encouragement, both in our conversations with one another and how we present the results of those conversations with you today. But the fact is, sincere followers of Jesus who land on either side of reopening may look back and either be confident that they were in the right or regret their choice and wish that they had acted differently on either side. Each of us has to work out the implications of these truths in our own context and decide which truths we want to emphasize in our own lives. As Paul says in Romans 14, 5, one person esteems one day is better than another, 
while another esteems all days alike, each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Be fully convinced in your own mind which biblical principle you want to use to guide your thoughts, words, and actions in this matter. But as we do so, we must keep in mind what scripture is very clear about, which is that the community of one another goes beyond just those of us at Northside, and that the community of one another goes beyond those who simply agree with us. And scripture is very clear that the way we are to treat other followers of Jesus in community with one another is reciprocal love. Pursuing Jesus, pursuing love and unity with humility and encouragement. May we have this mind among ourselves as we consider the ways we think, speak, and act around government protocols and the reopening of in-person worship services in our churches. Let me pray. Lord God, we just uh, thank you again for um, this time together to open your word and uh, to talk about community with one another and how to find love and unity, which you call us to. And we thank you for the example that you've shown us where you left your high and lofty position and you chose the lowly one for our sake and for the glory of God. You look not to your own interest. You look to the interest of others. We thank you for that incredible example. And we also thank you that you are the provision for us to be able to live that way as well. We pray that as we have conversations around really, really any conversations amongst other followers of Jesus, Lord, that we would have this mind among ourselves that is ours in Christ Jesus, that, that our, our conversations would be full of love and that we would be seeking to pursue unity. Teach us humility. Give us wisdom with our words that we may be encouraging and building one another up. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Thank you, Matthias, for sharing that this morning. Um, it's good. Let's uh, let's sing one more song together to, to wrap this up.
Christ completes his work in me. wanted to uh, send this out with these verses. Lamentations 3, 20 to 26 says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>